Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three topical countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Audrey. Hi, hi. And Cara. Hi. And I am your host, Fen, and today we're going to be talking about Flamecraft, Halapagus, and Final Girl. But first, we'll start with the standee catch-up, and what's been with you, Audrey? Uh, like the last time, I was there, not really much to say. Uh, my eye is getting much better since then. Um, the first 24, 28. 24, 48 hours were really rough, but uh, once I was past that, it was getting better and better and better all the time, and now, uh, yeah, I've already reached the point where my eyesight is better than it was before, considering that it was not awful, but in balance between both eyes. Um, so, due to that, I've been back uh, into board gaming a little bit, so with my husband, we did a, a big Aeon Trespass Odyssey session. I think we did five or six turns with two fights in there, so one a story fight and one uh, which was more a timeline. Yes, timeline. Um, so yeah, I was back to reading the rule book and the story book, so which was fine. And uh, other than that, I have a fog of log, uh, fog of love, sorry, purchase to report, which I'm very uh, impatient to to try out. Uh, and um, yeah, that is all for me, I think. Yeah. What about you, Kara? Uh, well, I um, it's Easter holidays here uh, right now, so um, that's good. I'm uh, having free time, and um, last week I, I kind of was in a like had some depression, but it's better now, and the weather is great. And yeah, and tomorrow I will uh, go to my newly bought house. Woo! And, take measurements and uh, decide where to put what. So really excited for that. Oh yeah, that's uh, exciting. <clears throat> yeah, apart from that, I haven't gotten around to playing a lot. I kind of got back into watching animes uh, the last couple of days. <laughs> and um, yeah, fun times. Mm, yeah. Uh... What about you, Fen? <laughs> Uh, well, we got back from Stockholm uh, last week. Um, the dog has finally decompressed from the whole incident. We uh, we just discovered, um, so my partner's older brother is a police officer, and he asked us about where we were staying, and we told him the location, and he went, ooh, and we'd already had a bad vibe from the place. Um, but it turns out it's a hotel that allegedly and has been done for sex trafficking. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, we, we're we particularly unhappy about that. But within like, we, we, we booked to be there for four days and we'd left within two already because like uh, Pam was not doing very well, even though it's supposed to be pet friendly. She was constantly being triggered by noises everywhere. So uh, we went to the in-laws, which was a lot nicer. Um but uh, we can't leave Pam unattended there because there are expensive paintings on the walls and uh, lots of antique furniture and stuff, so she has to be supervised. Uh, that was the main thing, um, uh, but we're, we're back. And um, it was snowing in Stockholm, and it is like, it's, it's like late spring here. It's incredible that just a four-hour ferry ride, the difference in uh, climate is really striking. Uh, and I took my first picture of Venus yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Not a good one, but um, uh, I've always rather liked um, people who take uh, our backyard hobby photographs of the planets. It's amazing how good the detail you can get is these days, uh, as Venus is quite high in the sky over here. Uh, it's the most prominently visible of the planets at the moment. Um, I had a go and took a picture of a white fuzzy blob with maybe a little bit of other colours. <laughs> um, but I wanted to see if I liked it before looking into spending more money on another hobby that I may not have time to do. Uh, which, which device did you use to take uh, a picture of? Just fun? Um, it was a normal camera along with a telescope. 
Okay. Uh, so it was a bit. I wasn't going to spend money, so it was a bit jury rigged. It's the, whatever camera I, I, I have. We have upstairs. It's my partner's camera. It's expensive. That's all I know. You know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but that actually reminds me, uh, like like PSA uh, for people liking to photograph stuff in the sky with their phones and thinking, oh, this camera is so amazing. Turns out that today's cameras and phones don't necessarily photograph the objects in the sky, but recognize them. And then the AI just puts a high resolution image of oh, whatever oh, you oh, try shit. to photograph <laughs> on it. So all these amazing moon photographs um, aren't real. Oh. It's just AI uh, overlapping a picture of the moon over your uh, low resolution photo. I so. did not know that and I feel so sad. <laughs> I, I've never tried uh, doing any picture like that with my phone, so I don't feel sad for wasting my time. But... Oh! First they came for the writers with chat GPT, then they came for the artists with mid journey, they're after the uh, astronomers next. Yeah. <laughs> If they could just replace all of the executives, uh, you know, CEOs and everything, um, that's what I'd prefer. We could just get rid of them. But I, I'm pretty sure they actually can, but the problem is the CEOs decide what AI gets used. So uh. Yeah, they're, they're in charge of... <laughs> they're, they're holding a lot of the <laughs> development of it. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, that was it. Uh, photography, Stockholm, travel, um, and a general sense of annoyance at Eon's End's distribution methods. Um, I'm going to very quickly express my annoyance at how hard it is to get the accessory packs. I The first accessory pack, no problem, got that, but it's a bit expensive. I wanted it for the dividers, um, and the I managed to get the fourth or fifth accessory pack. I think it's fourth one, but that's in the UK with my parents because the person who was selling it uh, wouldn't ship it into Europe because that's a nightmare for them now. I understand. Uh, but like nobody sells accessory pack two or three. They're not in the shops. It's just I, I really want to divide out all of the different um, breach mages so I don't have to spend ages constructing a deck whenever I sit down to play. So... Yeah. Uh, well, it can be worse, like in France, just being at the... three years late on any wave. But yeah, that's still annoying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't mind too much, I, but it's kind of pushing me towards having to back one of their Kickstarters to get the stuff, which I kind of don't really want to do. I'm trying to get away from backing Kickstarters, especially when my local stockist does stock most at Eon's end but it's hard when certain things don't hit retail and for me to properly organize I'm either going to have to make my own which means they won't match with the existing ones or I'm just going to have to live with it which is what I'm doing right now uh, but yeah yeah uh, Kickstarter exclusives quote unquote you know anyway uh, that's enough of that um, we are going to talk about I think is it, is it toast or is it cutlets it's something isn't it like like it's about cooking things and burning things. Um, uh, it, yeah. 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 Kara, tell us all about Flamecraft. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, Flamecraft uh, by Cardboard Alchemy. Uh, it uh, was on Kickstarter in August, September 2021 and was delivered last fall. And uh, it's a one to five player, um, yeah, kind of worker placement shared engine building game. I'm just throwing over, throwing together some some uh, keywords here. Isn't it a dragon placement? <laughs> a dragon placement. <laughs> yeah, it's a dragon placement game. Um, <clears throat> designed by Mani Vega and with beautiful, just beautiful art by Sandara Tang. I, I want to make clear it's Sandara Tang, not Sandra Tang. It's kind of sad that in, on Board Game Geek there are two artist entries for the game, one for Sandara Tang and one for Sandra Tang, um, because some people, I don't know, don't check spelling or so. Um, oh. And um, yeah, so um, in the game, you play uh, flame keepers, uh, people who are adept at communicating with dragons and figuring out what they actually want and need. And uh, your goal is to get the most reputation as a, f a flame keeper um, by placing dragons in different shops where they can uh, 
uh, follow their passions and uh, craft beautiful things um, or enchanting set shops and thereby helping develop uh, the town. Um, the dragons there come in seven different types. You have six artisan dragons and you have the fancy dragons. The fancy dragons um, aren't directly placed in the game. Um, you just, you can collect cards with them and they give you additional uh, scoring um, stuff. Um, while the artisan dragons um, <clears throat> Uh, six types for the six different resources. You have the iron dragons, you have the crystal dragons, the potion dragons, the bread dragons, um, plant dragons, and meat dragons. Yeah, I think so. Um, I have the German version, so if your dragons are named differently, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's saying meat here. Bread, meat, iron, crystal, plant, and potion. I love meat. bread dragons. But a bread dragon is super cute, but a meat dragon's a bit weird. Even though that's what most of them actually are. Yeah, that's why why I just I, I stumbled because I thought, well, it sounds weird in English, but okay. Um, <clears throat> I should have named it the baguette dragon in French. <laughs> so yeah, um, you take turns, and in your turn, um, you. Um, First, move your player uh, pawn to a shop, and uh, then you have to decide whether you want to collect resources or you want to enchant the shop. If you collect resources, it means you get the resources the shop produces or sells, though you don't pay them, so it produces the stuff. And um, then you may place one of the artisan dragons there, and each shop has three slots for artisan dragons. and. They have symbols denoting what types of dragons feel good there. So um, you can't just place a dragon anywhere, um, but they have to fit to the shop, except if you do it with some effect where you can switch dragons up or so. Um, then you get some reward from the shop for giving them a dragon that helps them out. And uh, then you may use the dragon's uh, special ability. Um, I think of any dragon in the shop. At least you, you can only use one dragon ability. And uh, advanced shops have a special shop ability which you can also use. And that's collecting resources. Enchantments, um, if you decide you want to enchant a shop, you uh, there are a couple of enchantments um, laying out uh, and they cost resources. Now, that's what you do with the resources you collect. You can do enchantments. So you pay the resources, you put the enchantment on the shop, which means it produces more resources later on. And then you may use all the special abilities of all dragons in this shop. Yeah? Um, depending on what type of dragon there are, they have different abilities. Each artisan, each type of artisan dragon has one shared ability. For example, every bread dragon has the ability that you may draw an additional dragon into your hand, which you can then later place. Um, yeah, and then at the end, um, after you did your uh, stuff, um, it comes, you know, the end of turn where you um, reveal new shops. If previously you filled up a shop completely with dragon, um, you discard cards and uh, resources which are above your limit. You have a hand limit of six cards, uh, six artisan dragons, and uh, a resource limit of seven per type. So if you're over that, you have to discard stuff. And um, the game ends once uh, either the deck of artisan dragons or the deck of enchantments runs out. Um, so yeah, it's pretty simple to explain and play. But um, when you play it, you might quickly realize that it actually has quite a lot of depth to it because the uh, game state changes all the time. You have to um, really think about what you want to do. Um, the, you can key abilities together. And so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of depth in there, but still it has this really nice entry um, and yeah also it looks really great um, though you might have some problems on some smaller tables not necessarily because it takes up a lot of space but because of the way it takes up the space um, it comes with a game mat 
um, even in the regular edition, not just in the deluxe edition. And the mat has a um, size of, um, it's 25.5 centimeters wide and 106 centimeters long for those of you who live across the pond and use some weird imperial measurements. It's uh, 30.1 by 125.2. I forgot the name, that's great. I prepared it and I didn't write the name down. Uh, what the, which, which, which name, which unit name? Yeah, the unit name. The, the Imperial unit name. Yeah, the Imperial unit name. All right, so do you mean twip, thou, inch, hand, foot, yard, chain, furlong, mile, league, fathom, cable, nautical mile, link, rod, or do you mean barleycorn? Barleycorn, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you chose it the last one, right? Yeah. It was yes. on, on, on purpose. That was, that was on purpose. <laughs> I, 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 didn't get, I didn't get into Aries either. I was hesitating to say Balicorn because I remembered it and I had fun start and I was oh this is getting fun. <laughs> so yeah, now all you all of you over in the US also know exactly how large it is. Uh, so yeah, it's very long and narrow and you place the shops on the sides and um, yeah, but again, it's it's so beautiful. I love it. Yeah, this this is a game that I remember seeing a lot uh, during the uh, Kickstarter and or the uh, pre-order um, um, pledge manager uh, period. And yeah, I do remember many many people being like, "Oh, these are so cute! I'm going to get them." And when the game arrived, I also saw a bit of hype due to the gameplay and many people realizing that I think. If I remember correctly, it was a bit more complex uh, than what they expected, not by a lot, but just a little bit, and they ended up being happily surprised by it not being just a, a cute game with cute uh, dragon minis, but also yes, to, there to be a bit of more, bit more thinking uh, to the game that one, than what they expected. If I yeah. remember properly. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's definitely imaginable because when you look at the art and, uh, you know, you look at, oh, what can you do? You have these two actions which are not very complicated. So it really sounds like this very easy, simple family game, which it isn't necessarily. I mean, it depends on your family, but. Yeah, yeah. I. Uh... I got this, uh, being of course as someone who uh, was born in Tanya Daigoch in the Fires of the Red Dragon, or if you prefer Wales for another one, uh, I decided I would pick this up. I just got the basic normal edition, and I haven't managed to get it to the table yet beyond opening it up and looking at it and going, ooh, okay, uh, yeah, this is very pretty, and this is by my, one of my, my favourite artists. Um, uh, she's also done artwork for Lord of the Rings and Netrunner and Descent. It's always a pleasure, but that's, those are obviously very different styles. So I can't comment on how it plays because I didn't have time to actually play it. I forgot to pack it with us when we went on the trip. More importantly, I don't think I knew before going that you were going to talk about this. So no, it's all right. It's fine. It's just one of those things. But I can say that I'm perfectly happy with the non-deluxe version. In fact, I think I'm a bit happier not having the plastic dragons, uh, which are cute. But um, I think the wooden uh, wooden meeples do a great job. The wooden ones will make me think of the dragon that is in the clunk box. Mm -hmm. Just a yeah, little bit. Yeah, they do. Just a bit, yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah, I mean, that maybe, um, you know, the difference between the regular and the deluxe version is, as you said, you know, the deluxe dragons, you have metal coins instead of, instead of cardboard ones, you have wooden resource tokens instead of cardboard ones. And um, I think that's it. I mean, the Kickstarter came with a few like promo shops, um, which I believe you wouldn't really notice if they were just mixed in with the rest. and doesn't don't add much um yeah and yeah. at least I, I i just checked in uh the uh, online shop uh, i usually frequent uh, the german one it costs 33 euros the standard edition which for a you know full-fledged big 
board game is pretty low. Yeah, it is pretty low. Um, I would say the only bit I miss is actually the wooden pieces. I I really like how the wooden pieces uh, are. They're they're gorgeous. Um, and I tell you something I'm still not completely sure about, the shop names. I, I love the shop names. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I like sometimes they amuse me and sometimes they make me just be like, oh, God, no. Um, it, there's some nice references and I am a fan of Easter eggs. So I, I think on the whole they're positive. But uh, uh yeah, you, you have to the problem right. is I can't really tell any of them because I have a German edition and uh, they are translated or most of them are translated. So no one would understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> they're probably like if they've been well translated, they're, they're probably changed a bit as well to fit. Otherwise, they wouldn't be. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I, I assume you haven't got Draco Bell or directly. That's one of them. Uh, there's um, uh, critical roles, of course. Yeah, I think that's a promo one. I should have that one as well. Mm. I mean, in German, we, we have uh, Taba Laguna, which is a reference to a kids TV show, uh, mm -hmm. Tabaluga with a dragon in it. We have a Rachkin Donuts. I think that the English one has something close to it. It would probably have something yeah, like Dragon Donuts or, yeah, or Dracking Donuts. Yeah, I'd imagine so. Um, it's... <sighs> I mean, whoever sat down and did all that work to come up with all those pun names, um, maybe they deserve a raise because <laughs> there's a lot and they're all pretty consistent in the quality in that either you'll love them or you will get really annoyed with them. But I think they're, 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 they're pretty great. Yep, I've oh, talked yeah. myself around on them. There we are. I, I started off with this whole bit of like, I'm not sure about them, but I've now looked a bit more. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, actually, yeah, this is this is a perfect amount of stupid cutesiness on top of this slightly uh, sardonic uh, capitalist exploitation game. <laughs> it's a fun one, but... <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there are six starter shops with which when you start, and uh, one of them is Sailor Bloom in Germany, and mm. uh, a bloom as the German word for for bloom, a, a, a flower. So, and it's a plant shop. It's ah, it's just I love it. I love it. It's <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I really particularly love the dragon names more than anything because they yeah. are kind of fun, but they're also like very cute. You get like, what's it, iron dragons are called like coal and flint. Uh, and then um, you'll get like meat f related ones like hickory. But my goodness, if fondue isn't one of my favorite dragons. Oh, I just, uh, a bread dragon, Kuchenzahn, which would translate to cake tooth. And that's, yeah. Um, also noteworthy regarding the art, every single dragon you see in this game is different from all the others. There are no two exact replicas of the artwork. You do see, like like uh, Sandara Tang use use templates and colored them differently or gave them different accessories, but still every card has its own illustration, which is crazy. Yeah, that's that's cool when it happens. Yeah, it's definitely one of those games that you can break out with a bunch of people, and as long as they are up for something saccharine sweet and cutesy they're gonna be like oh there's there's a lot to enjoy and it's definitely i think a good way of, of demonstrate what board games can do from a visual viewpoint like th this is this could have been a very competent but basic um worker placement type game but it is one of those ones elevated by not just the theme but the artwork And I really like, you know, this shared engine building. Like, I mean, you need to collect resources to enchant and you enchant to collect more resources, but the enchantment works for everyone. So, and when you place dragons, they also work for everyone. Um, so together you build up this big engine that all of you can use and try to outdo each other in the end. Yeah, it's kind of fun to... A lot of worker placement games and the older styles, you'll have your own separate board that you construct your engine on. 
and instead here you're building the engine for everyone and trying to take the best advantage of it. Here are the resources, we're building this village together, exploit them as well as you can. Yeah, so anyway, um, big, big recommendation from me, um, if only for the great artwork. And as I said, the regular edition is pretty cheap. So why are you waiting? Yeah, it sounds like a good punt for this kind of price. Might get a, might get some younger gamers involved as well. Okay, that is Flamecraft. And next up we have uh, Audrey with Halapagus, which is another fantastic pun name, I must say. Yes, but uh, since the game has been actually written by uh, French authors, uh, Laurence Gamelin and Philippe Gamelin, and the artist being Jonathan Ocant, uh, I'm going to use its French name, Galera Pago. Since a French na game, I have to use the French uh, name. Galère means two things. There is the galley, the, the boat. And also, when you say something is the galère, it means that it's hell. So that uh, also works. Um, so yeah, in, in Galera Pagos, uh, 3 to 12 players take on roles of um, um, survivors from a crash or something on a desert island and your goal is to build a raft, to stay hydrated, to stay fed uh, until you have enough space on the raft to escape the island. So every turn is actually a day. And players can take uh, turns doing some actions to, well, just simply say, get food, get wood, get water, or get items. Basically foraging uh, the, um, the, the remainders of the, um, of the wreckage. Sorry. Um, so yeah, basically it's about doing actions and getting some luck in how much uh, rewards you, you get. Because for instance, when you're going fishing, you, ha you are going to draw uh, wooden balls from a bag. I think there are five or six wooden balls with different numbers of fish uh, designed on them. And you're just going to get, uh, I don't remember, one or two balls? Or it's just, no, it's a bit of push your luck, you draw a ball, maybe you can draw another one, and if you get a black one, you're out of luck, uh, and you're not getting that. There is an equivalent mechanic for uh, the wood harvesting. Um, and so you're going to push your luck a bit to try and get as many resources that you can to help everyone survive. <laughs> At the end of the day, you are going to see if you have enough food and enough water for everybody to make it through, to survive. So you're going to basically count the resources that you have and then maybe have a vote on who should not get food and or water and get eliminated. So that's when it gets tricky because no, that's not a cooperative game, that's a semi-cooperative game. So you're going to be ending up with Maybe several votes in a row, eliminating every time someone. Maybe, oh, this guy didn't have any luck bringing, it, bringing us wood, so yeah, you're, you're out. And that's where the cards that you can harvest from the wreckage get handy, because due to them you can say, eh, no, I actually have a bottle of water, so even if you say that I don't drink, I actually can drink, so I'm not getting uh, eliminated this turn. Um, some of these items can also let you kill other people because there is a pistol, but you also need to get bullets to be able to use it. So that's uh, the items is um, surviving with items is quite easy, but being able to do extra things with the items uh, is a bit less easy, I would say. Uh, and it continues until you have a raft, until you have built a raft that can let enough people to get out. And you also need extra food and water because who knows how long you will be on the water. So you still need more resources than just uh, what's needed to get through that final day on the island. Uh, so yeah, overall it's quite a simple game because you don't have many actions to do. Um, but all the parts of negotiating with your friends at the table and seeing who can do what to end up surviving or not, uh, who can help people and who will be selfish. Because yeah, you may be able to say, oh, 
We don't have enough water, but this guy there, he just went for cards. He was not helping the group, so you're out. So there will be all this uh, little element of negotiation, and of course playing two games back to back can also be interesting. Yeah, I can imagine. So this strikes me in some ways if you take uh, Robinson Crusoe, the board game, and distill it down to a very basic level, and then actually throw in, like, survivor style stuff um lord of the flies almost pretty yes. pretty interesting there's not many games that do stranded on a desert island that dig into how things get when resources are short and how uh vicious things can be when lives are on the line it's um it's definitely interesting as a concept i've not seen it in board game form elsewhere like lifeboats is close ish but not really um, it's very interesting. Yeah, it, it's it's simple, but yeah, it's it's not a usual topic. Yeah. Um. So, I had a couple of questions. What happens when a player is eliminated? Obviously, they're out of the game. But what happens to all the stuff that they've gathered? Like, if they've been grabbing cards. Do those are those removed from the game, or do they become up for grabs for people? No, oh, I think I think the cards get removed from the game. And the fun story: uh, two two weeks ago or three weeks ago, it doesn't matter. Uh, with my husband, we were at the uh, MJC, which is Maison des Jeunes et de la Culture, House of Youth and Culture, and we were at the board game and role playing club, and we were playing a Starfinder. And there was a little boy who was probably six, maybe five, uh, that arrived at a room and was like, "Oh, we were playing Galerapagos, and I." just got killed and it was fun and I had a pistol and uh, okay so the eliminated player they can go roam around and their cards get lost okay so so I, I've gathered from a quick look that like when you get the gun you you it's, it says it's like a permanent like you put it in front of you um so is that like you get the gun and you go look I've got a gun and nobody knows if you've got bullets or not until they call your bluff I've I when we played uh, we did not encounter the and if I remember correctly, we just encountered the bullets. So I am not exactly able to answer that question. But yeah, if if it is like that and there is that bluffing element of hey hey, that can be fun. Yeah, I I, I did. I was looked at an image that said like the uh, the gun was a permanent use. It's, it says permanent use. This card is out of your hand of cards when you're eliminated. So I thought it was because it looked different to the bullet that it maybe was put down in front. Um, but I definitely hope uh, that the game has space for waving a gun at people. And um, I mean, you, you can just imagine the situation. I'm sure it must happen at some point where somebody has a gun and a, a slightly absurd number of bullets. Um, is there any like trading of cards between people? No, no, you, you, you can't uh, give your cards. If I, I think... I, 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 Sorry. I don't think you can give your cards, uh, honestly. Uh, I think that... The... Mm, yeah, no, no, I don't think you can at all. Mm. Well, this is starting to sound like a really interesting concept for maybe a, a, a sequel that's more in-depth and detailed, because I, I definitely want a sequel, because I want them to keep those round balls of fish. That's like... those are, that I've not seen... Um, Bag tokens look like that. That's fantastic. Wooden balls. Uh, yeah. ex, 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 much ex, better than cardboard. Excuse me, I just checked. And yes, trading is allowed between players even after the voting phase for lacking water, including Fan the voted person. Uh, it's, it is allowed when someone threatens to shoot. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> once a bullet is played against someone, there's not trading until mm. either the bullet hits or it's deflected. Like mm. uh, a, a de uh, own metal plate or something like that. You can also yeah. promise to do that. Uh, you cannot show your cards to other players. So mm -hmm. you can say, oh, I'm going to give you a bottle of water, but you don't have it. Oh, and yeah. Uh, oh, can you trade um, card? Oh, there must be. Yeah, there's useless cards. I'm also looking at the rules now. So you can like lie to people and trade them junk. This is getting... Very fun. I could see an alliance between yeah. two people with one person, like that, because the guns are permanent, so they put it in play. And they go, look, I've got a gun, and somebody else is like, I've got lots of bullets, so let's rule this thing. I'll hand you the bullets, um, and you know you can deal with everything. And then uh, 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 they don't hand them bullets; they hand them like a lunchbox or something. 
And yeah. so this person's left there with an empty gun and they've been threatening <laughs> everyone and suddenly they're caught out. And it's like, oh, yeah, this I, this is sounding like a very exciting, fun game to play and watch. Yeah, you, you, you can definitely also ally, ally against someone. Like, oh, I have a bullet, you have uh, a gun, or I'm going to give you my bullet and you shoot this guy. Uh, lo- lo- lots of possibilities. Oh, yeah, yeah. You could, Castaway can be saved by another player who offers ration of food or water. Um, yeah, this is this is sounding like something I really, really enjoy, uh, depending on how long is the game? Oh, it's it's not very long, to be honest. Uh, I would say that with explanations, the first game, you will probably be around one hour and a quarter. But that's due to the explanations and probably encountering all the items uh, for the first time. Okay, okay. Um, uh, and uh, among the items, you also have some permanent buffs, uh, like something that would say that every time you go fetch wood, you get one more plank or stuff like that. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, this is definitely looking at the kind of thing I really like uh, a great deal. And there um, is an expansion, or maybe two, that I cannot talk about since I did not try. Hmm. Oh yeah. There's. So it's called "They're No Longer Alone" in English. I assume that means. Oh, characters, another tribe inhabiting the island, and additional shipwreck cards. I see. So that's very much like if you enjoy Halapagus, you've got opportunity to spice it up even further. Cool. And I think um, like in uh, it, it has two releases, and in the newer release, they included this expansion already. So if you buy it, you should have it, I think. Maybe I don't. I did not really look into that, so I can't really tell. But maybe. Oh, that's okay. That's, this is definitely something that I am like. Ooh, I could see this going down really well with the uh, family at like Christmas time or um, Easter when there's a lot of them around. Um, yeah, yeah. it's been a big hit. Yeah, the the fact that you can accommodate three uh, to twelve players, it's really nice. Yeah, yeah, definitely the kind of um, uh, game I, I really enjoy a great mm-hmm. deal. Uh, it's the kind of thing you could squeeze in if you don't have time for a full blood on the clock tower. Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, right, so that's Halapagus, um, uh, which is a game all about uh, surviving on a desert island. And our last game is also about surviving, but uh, in a variety of different locations. It's me, and I'm going to be talking about Final Girl which is a 2021 release uh, from Van Ryder Games, designed by Evan Derrick and AJ Porfiro. Or, Por- yeah, Porfiro, I, yeah, forget it, forget it, I've lost it. I learned how to pronounce his name, and then it slipped my mind, <laughs> and now I'm having trouble with it. I've only got room for so much, and it, today it's Imperial Inches that are in my head. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, so this is a evolution of the system from hostage negotiator which i talked about in the past i remember yeah hostage negotiator is a fun little solo quote-unquote boss battler where you are uh, a hostage negotiator dealing with a kidnapper and a bunch of hostages and you are in your location the the kidnapper and the victims are like inside the building um and amazingly they've taken that system and translated it into Final Girl, where now you're moving around a map, and the opposition is also moving around a map. So before I go into details, uh, first of all, Cara and Audrey, um, where do you land in respect to horror movies? And there's no wrong answer. I much prefer the bloody for fun movies than the movies that are really have an ambience, if I may say. Like I'm more going to lo- to watch so and laugh actually uh, than um, I don't even have an example saying I don't watch horror movies. So you prefer like a bit of a comedy and a fun lightness to it, even though it's like a a, a horror slasher. Yeah, I prefer overdoing. Right. right, so you would you would be more interested in something like Happy Death Day or Ready or Not, things like that, which or Cabin in the Woods. I have no that. idea what you're talking about, but I trust you on that. <laughs> they, they all have a little bit, or maybe Shaun of the Dead, that's another example of a comedy horror. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, how about you, Cara? Okay, but, uh, I, I'm definitely with Shaun of the Dead or Black Sheep. Um, I totally dislike, I'm trying to find a good, good phrase for it, um, 
reality-based horror, like, you know, uh, taking a vacation in the woods and bad things happen. I, no, no, thank you, no. But it's... aliens, you know, some mm. science fiction stuff. And okay, that, that's fine with me. I love the alien movies. Um, but yeah, not this, if it hits too close home, then, then no. <laughs> more, more fantastical in the horror as opposed to the, the they can be quite nasty, um, like home invasion movies and things. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, that's absolutely fine. I just wanted to get a gauge because I'm not, I, I've got a weird relationship with horror movies. I don't really watch them, but some of my favorite movies are technically horror movies, Alien and the thing are easily in my top five movies, um, and both of them are out and out horror movies. Um, but if, if I may, I do have a problem with Alien. Mm, you do? Uh, yeah, and uh, actually, I am tocophobic, uh, which uh, for those that don't know, it's the fear of all things linked to pregnancy. Uh... Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's perfectly understandable. I mean, that that is overtly a theme in all of the series. Uh, and yeah, if you have a genuine trigger over it, it's going to be a, a problem. Um, I have watched it and it... Yeah. Just five very bad minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so I don't really watch them for the most part, but I am very familiar with with a lot of them because I kind of like to watch people review horror movies as opposed to watch them um i mean like i've watched some of the good i don't know if they call them elevated horror but stuff more recent like get out nope um and the later scream movies i've watched those and they're kind of a bit satirical um but i i my my grandpa was very into special effects and practical effects so he would often tell me stories about um, what they did in Predator and uh, Terminator. And my dad showed me Alien when I was very young. Although he showed me basically up until the point that it's just like they get to the planet and it's before Cain um, is attacked. So he left a curiosity in me. Um, but uh, for example, I've only ever seen, I think it's... Friday the 13th, Jason in Manhattan, and I've only seen the back half of that, and it was terrible. Um, and it's known to be terrible. But anyway, I have, as I say, I have kind of a curiosity, like an adjacency to horror, uh, and I like horror as a genre, but I don't really care to watch stuff, especially if it has jump scares. I just, I find them cheap. Um, like, I think Barbarian last year did a good job of holding tension and, like, having something to say. Um, but then again, like Halloween or something, no thank you. Anyway, I just wanted to ask because I'm going to warble a bit about um, the actual background behind the name of the game, which is Final Girl, uh, which is a horror trope. And this was coined by Carol J. Clover in the book Men, Women and Chainsaws, Gender in the Modern Horror, modern horror Film. It's a 1992 publication and it's really good. It's very much an exploration and a discussion of what um, horror means towards feminism. And um, there's no agenda going into it. She's uh, exploring through the whole thing and has a lot of different stuff to say. And it's kind of a fascinatingly good book. Um, but she's the one who coined the phrase final girl. Uh, and it's very narrow under her definition. So... She defines it as a woman who is the sole survivor of a group of people, usually youths, who are chased by a villain, who gets a final confrontation with the villain. Um, and it doesn't matter if she kills the villain herself or is saved by, in the last minute by someone else. And then the other elements are like she gets to do this because of her implied um, superiority over others, because she's uh, virginal and she doesn't drink, she doesn't do drugs, she doesn't involve in vices. That's like the original classic. Luckily, modern um, horror movies, The Final Girl is far broader than that, uh, which I appreciate. Uh, Scream did a lot to uh, create more realistic characters um, um, within, its genre, within its genre. More realistic, rounded characters. I mean, like, uh, uh, Sydney and Gale are people, yeah? They're not, like, 
perfect. Um, there, there's, uh, there's also this one. Uh, the it's, I think it's Anya Taylor John Joy who's playing in the um, ah God I I can't grasp the, the name. It's in the Sh- Shyamalan. Um, the menu. E- e- yeah, may- maybe. Well, is it is it about um, going to an island for meals? No, it's the no. one which is in the trilogy, well, trilogy of the superheroes uh, the, with uh, Will Smith. Um, oh, God, I, I can't remember the name of the movie. Uh, oh, oh, wait, wait. It's, um, it's, it's not Glass. Uh, it's... Right, M. Night Shyamalan's um, Unbreakable trilogy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, Unbreakable Split and Glass. Split. Split, split. Of- yes, split. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. So it, what I was trying to say is that the the original version is kind of, I think, a bit sort of, it's very male centric. Oh, this, this woman is worthy to survive because she is pure. And as we get further on in time, you get more realistic characters, some of whom, uh, like Ellen Ripley, is writ- was originally written with no particular gender in mind. Same with every cast member on that, every member of the crew. They could have been either male or female. Um, and I think she did quite a bit to uh, broach, like not just being something better, uh, something more than just a, a, a you know, a, a, an icon on a pedestal. Um, and likewise with Sarah Connor, the original Terminator movie, in my opinion, is also a horror movie. It's kind of a sci-fi thriller as well, but it's very much, uh, you know, a merciless killer going after one person. So I think it lands in there. Um, anyway, so that's the that's the final girl. Uh, the, the there's like not a definite point when we have our first ever final girl, but um, some of the ones that are suggested is like Lila Crane from Psycho, um, or I think maybe the most famous one would be Sally Hardsty from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, who um, does survive, and then I it was killed in the 2022 terrible movie. Like, I don't know why they bothered bringing her back with a new actress if they're just going to kill the character. That's another thing that they kind of do to Final Girls, is they bring them back in future sequels and then kill them off. So far, Sidney Prescott and Gail Weathers haven't died, but eh, I worry about that. Anyway, um, what I mean to say is like the, the trope's gone and grown places, and it's it's got a lot of trappings, though. Uh, like Hostage Negotiator, if you look at Final Girl and you're like, oh, this is terrible, why would I want to play a character in a horror movie? It's perfectly understandable. But, as solo games go, this one really sticks the landing on being thematic. Uh, It is, however, a little awkward to get into, because you have to buy a core box, and that contains most of the components that are used when you play. It's a very nice box, it's the size of a VHS um, case, uh, deliberately so. This is one here, and it's got magnetic clasps. And inside, it has the rule book and like the victims, the dice, the standard action cards, the health tokens, and other tracking bits and pieces that are used across all of the different. They call them feature films, but you can't play the game like that. Uh, ticking along in the background, what every once in a while, uh, listeners may remember me complaining about the fact that I received the core box and no feature films, so I couldn't play it. Um, it took a while. They all arrived earlier this year, uh, both series. So you have to also get, as they call them, as I mentioned, a feature film box. Um, the what two I'm going to use as examples to talk about today. Uh, the first one is Camp Happy Trails, which is inspired by Friday the 13th. So it takes place in a camp around a lake. And uh, Into the Void, which is based on Alien. Um, and uh, takes place on board a spaceship, the USS Conrad. So, um, there's a lot to setting up this game, like a lot, but they've tried to make it as easy as possible. Uh, So you have a board that you put down that tracks the horror level, um, and that will start on a certain number set by the killer. Uh, It determines how many dice you get to roll. Green, Things are pretty okay, not too scary. You get to roll three dice. White, 
which is the middle section. That's kind of like the normal level of, uh, of horror. And then if it gets up into red, you're only getting to roll one dice because things have gotten way out of control and your character is panicking like heck. Uh, you'll then pick a uh, location and a killer. So, for, for example, you pick Camp Happy Trails with Hans the Butcher. Um, and you'll pick a final girl. Uh, you have Laurie and Rico in Camp Happy Trails. Uh, Laurie is named after the same Laurie from uh, Halloween, which is... Uh, she's a classic um, final girl. Uh, and then you'll sort out life for each character, because this game tends to only end with either you or the killer dead. The killer will have quite a lot of life points, like Hans has 12, and the uh, final girls have less um, like Rico has six. But the interesting thing about the health is your final point isn't the same as the others. Uh, they're normally represented with little wooden hearts, but the last one is a token, a black token, with a heart pictured on it. And the backside can either be blank or have a number of hearts on it. I think between one and three. And what happens is when either you or the killer dies, loses the last heart, you flip it up. And if there's hearts on it, you that character gets to immediately heal that much and it kind of represents that classic trope of you think the final girl's died but she hasn't she survived or you think that the killer's dead and they come back for one last uh, thing which is very common in the screen movies so uh, then um, you'll lay out the killer's board you'll lay out the location board um, these are the covers of the VHS they detach via magnets so the whole thing is very compact. The one downside of this is there's a fold in the top of the board and it doesn't lay flat. It kind of like flips up and down, um, which can be annoying for some people. Uh, so be aware of that. But it's a very mechanically elegant situation to allow you to transport around a game in a very small box and get it set up quickly. You'll then draw a setup card, which tells you where you start on the board, where the killer starts on the board, and where all the victims start. And you'll shuffle up all the items available for that location and put four of them into three piles. So you'll have a total of 12 cards in three different piles, and the top card of each is face up. They'll correspond to some locations on the map where you know you can go and search. In the case of Camp Happy Trails, it's like some um, huts and buildings, and you'll be able to find uh, stuff like maybe a flashlight or an axe or health kit, things to try and help you along the way. The victims um, essentially allow you and Hans to also scale your power. If Hans, or the killer, I'll just say Hans for now, if Hans gets to a victim, he'll kill him, no problem. Chop him up, whatever he actually does. Hits him with a sledgehammer by the looks of it. Um, and he'll gain on his track, on his like little, um, I forget the name of it, it's like, like a little track that gradually increases more and more, and uh, he gets stronger as that goes up. And eventually he'll, unlock, he'll increase the terror level at certain points, um, and gain dark powers which will unlock on more. Essentially he gets stronger and stronger and deals more and more damage. You, in contrast, have to get to the victims, and escort them to the ex exits on the map, and you can only escort a maximum of two victims at a time. Whenever you do that, you get to put one on your board, whenever you rescue one, and you'll get a little one-off bonus that might let you move or gain a card or heal. And if you've rescued enough to cover all of the spaces on your card, you get to flip over and get your final girl ability, which is like a nice, strong, additional ability to help you take down the killer. The really interesting part of this game though is the card system so you will lay out a load of piles of cards and they all have in the bottom right corner time costs um, now for example uh, the card sprint uh, costs you two time to pick up and you'll roll the dice if you get two stars two successes uh, you'll get to move three spaces if you get one you'll get to move two spaces and then if you fail to roll any stars uh, you'll increase the terror level. And this is the tension in the game because the dice are kind of mean. Uh, they're like Arkham Horror, the board game, in that only a five or a six is an actual success. Uh, and you're only usually only rolling like two or three dice unless you've spent cards to get bonus dice temporarily. Um, 
On a three or a four, you get this symbol of two cards. And what that means is you can discard two cards from your hand to score yourself a success. So you have some control over what's going on. But the big like, difficulty with this is whenever you play a card, it effectively goes down on cooldown and you can't get it back again on that turn. Uh, you'll have to pick up other cards. Even your zero cost cards are like this. So if you walk twice in your first turn, you can't walk in your second turn because they're both on cooldown. Um, additionally, some cards will let you gain more time units. You start with six per round, or you'll lose some by doing stuff. And you need to be careful because at the end of your round, you're going to buy cards with your remaining time. If you don't have any time left, you're not going to buy any cards. So there's a lot of push and pull of trying to manage that, and it's what makes the game so interesting is picking these cards to help you do stuff, but there's also some randomness in how they're going to happen. In Hans's turn, the killer's turn, um, they will draw cards from the terror deck. Now the terror deck's pretty interesting because it is constructed of two separate decks, uh, which is the killer's cards and the location cards. They're shuffled together and then you take a certain number of them, normally 10, and that will determine what the killer does and what happens in the location. So it kind of makes the experience a bit random, even if you're just playing the same round over and over, uh, but also it, uh, it like allows you to have weird stuff like um, the Evo Morph from, uh, from Into the Void running around a, th a carnival or a poltergeist in space. Um, that's like a big draw of the system is not just that you have a lot of permutations within the one box, but that you can combine the others together. Uh, there's a bunch of other things that like make it more sort of a more nuance to it, like items, and you can only carry certain items in your hands, etc. The killer like gets minor powers that give them more health and extra abilities that you can knock off them by harming them. Um, but essentially the game devolves down to this location-based chase where you're trying to rescue people and the killer's trying to kill them. Um, and eventually you're hopefully strong enough to take down the killer with a few furious blows or maybe some like retaliatory defences and things, um, and you win, maybe, or you don't. Um, what this game does more than anything, and like, there's a lot of crunch and mechanics in this, and there's a lot of setup, but it really nails that feeling of being in a horror movie, uh, of being the protagonist of a horror movie, and just unexpected things happening, and you're constantly having to adapt to it all without being too random. Um, if this was an older design, I'd imagine you'd just be rolling on tables and nonsense would be occurring. So, yeah. Um, the, uh, so you have to get the core box. You have to get one of the, uh, one of the feature film boxes. But that comes in at less than €50 Euros for both, which I think is pretty reasonable. There's a whole lot of extra nonsense chrome you can get. Um, but the main difficulty is how how these things sell out and will Van Ryder games struggle to keep them in available retail uh, and also the Kickstarters you can get bitten by the desire to just have everything um, which I don't think you really need there's there's I, I wish this was more re readily available retail because it's a good game for you buy the core box in one particular um, scenario and you play that with the two different characters and you play it a bunch of times and then when you're feeling confident with it maybe you pick up something else that you like the theme of and that's where the game would be like fantastic. Um, series 1, I'm going to very briefly walk through these and then we'll, we'll maybe chat a little bit more um, but you have Happy Trails Horror which is a Friday the 13th, Frightmare on Maple Lane which is Nightmare on Elm Street uh, there's Slaughter in the Groves, which isn't based on anything in particular. The Haunting of Creech Manor is based on Poltergeist. Uh, Carnage at the Carnival is based on that combination of circuses, clowns, and also the villain is um, Geppetto, who's based off the Puppet Master. There's Terror from Above, which is a small card game expansion that has you thrown into the middle of Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. Uh, then there is the second series, um, I have with me right here, um, downstairs, the Eva, the uh, as I said, Into the Void. So this is the um, hashtag not alien. And there's a huge ev evolution in what the game is doing in comparison to how simplistic it is when you play Happy Trails Horror. 
because uh, the Evo Morph is is like it starts off as a tiny little creature that's very fast, very very dangerous. Like it will one shot you if it attacks you, um, and uh, but very weak physically. If you manage to corner it and kill it, it's it, it can't take much in the way of damage. Uh, but it goes around and as it kills things, it pops off the board and evolves much like the alien in Aliens. It can evolve twice um, to like a hatchling form and then an adult form. So you play a game of cat and mouse with it disappearing from the board and you're trying to track it and bring it back, um, like find out where it's hiding on board the ship. Uh, the ship itself also has like multiple ways of helping you deal with the evil morph. You can turn on the trash compactor, which is going to hurt it if it goes in there and also crush any victims who are silly enough to run in there. Um, there's like a incinerator. There's even a self-destruct that you can run off. If you collect enough key cards, you can activate it. And once the countdown is done, if you're in an escape pod, you win and it, it dies. Um, which is pretty cool how, this is like way more sophisticated. You even got like the classic power loader from Aliens that you can uh, dress up in uh, and that will improve your stats for combat, but to make it harder for you to find things and escort it's incredible what they do to um to recontextualize the mechanics and give each scenario the feeling and themes of that particular one uh, second series includes alien uh red riding hood uh silent hill uh it home invasion style uh movies so the strangers and um and similar uh the thing um, Panic at Station 2891, which I really like because I think it does a very good job of replicating the thing. Um, yeah, so there is a lot, a lot of content. There's a lot of extra additional crazy nonsense chrome as well. You can buy the mystery box that is basically a giant plastic Necronomicon that contains two dice that you use to randomize the killer and location just for the first series. Um, it's gorgeous and it's pointless. So, yeah. Um, the mats though are really good like if you do want to play the mats make a huge difference to improving the experience but you only really need the series 2 mat so yeah um, I, I'm of the opinion if you're interested in horror um, and the slasher style of movie and you like the twists and turns that the narrative takes but you're not interested in something that's going to freak you out with a cheap jump scare of oh it's a cat um, oh yeah the cat's in there uh, uh, in, in Into the Void, Jonesy, the cat. He's called Jonas in it, yeah. And he runs around the place and helps you out if you manage to catch him and calm him down, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, that, that's something I completely forgot about. There's even special meeples that represent, like, characters unique to the scenario. So you might have, like, a, a your boyfriend or girlfriend might turn up and you, you it's extra bad if they get killed. Uh, but escorting them around is very difficult because they're slow and they don't want to... They just want to hang out and stuff, or let's say Jonesy the cat and all sorts of others. It's uh, it's amazing what they're doing with this system, and it's. I don't think they can ever do a career mode the same that they did with Hostage Negotiator, but I'm not sure they need to with how thematically gripping this game is. So yeah, um, how about you guys? I've talked a lot. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, it, it's not, it's not for, for me at all. Uh, but I think that was to be expected with uh, how I answered to the question about horror movies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. F I, I think that some parts of it uh, can be interesting of the game, but the, the theme itself uh, is... Yeah, yeah, it is. It's like Hostage Negotiator does do things to make you kind of like question and feel a bit uncomfortable playing the game because you're when you start thematically thinking about it you're being asked sometimes to sacrifice hostages in order to you know do things um to help resolve the conflict or even in one case in hostage negotiator um there's a man who's just desperate to get his uh, son medical treatment which i really liked because it's 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 kind of a statement on what how important good health care can be to people and you know, fathers, mothers pushed to desperation for their children can do scary things and you really need some sort of, uh, you know, decent system of universal health care to assist those people who can't afford it. So that, that there's stuff to think of. There's less of that to think about in this, which is interesting because 
generally horror movies have a lot to say um, about society, or at least about like filmmaking. Um, Scream very famously, but also Jordan Peele's movies um, definitely have stuff to say. So, uh, how about you, Kara? Um, I mean, I, I have looked into it before, um, but I wasn't sure. And I, from what you just just told, I could see myself, you know, when uh, the core box is available again, um, <laughs> uh, grabbing the core and maybe one or two of the feature films, if I do definitely the Into the Void stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, it sounds interesting. Cool. Well, I mean, if nothing else, if you if you pop over to visit us again on the island, um, I've got an I've got two sets to play with basically, so you can easily have a go and try, see if you like it. Um, but yeah, 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 it's it's definitely a it's a worthwhile experience if you enjoy solo games and if you want that movie experience without having to. Um, actually sit through stuff that may f make you feel very uncomfortable. I mean, I definitely, I I kind of like and dislike this idea of, you know, you buy the core box and then whatever module basically you want to play, which is um, similar to what Unsettled does with the, um, yeah. how do they call it? Base framework. Yeah. yeah. But what I like uh, by with Unsettled more is if you buy the base framework, you do have two planets with it. So. Definitely that. I've been through exactly this problem. We know I have. <laughs> I spent a long time with the core box sitting around and I I didn't even open it because I couldn't. No. Yeah, yeah. I, w I will agree that maybe the core game should come bundled with one feature film. I think that's yeah. a very good point. And I mean, sure, it, it says so on the box, on the backside, you need a feature film to play it, but we know how people are and I can definitely see people going into a store, buying this core box and getting home and unpacking it and being confused why they can't play it. So yeah. uh, you can even um, go through the situation if you buy the core box and then you buy like Terror from Above or Terror from the Grave, which is a small um, scenario, but it's only really the killer half of the scenario. So you're still stuck. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh, I I do think I do think I would be wholeheartedly recommending this if they could keep it in retail enough that people could pop in, get a core box, and whichever scenario they like the look of, whatever movie they're a fan of, um, uh, you could wait until a Kickstarter comes again. They're going to do a third series. They've admitted it in the text in the books. So that's coming. Um, maybe you can jump in and pick up like a little bit there, uh, which is worth keeping an eye on. Um, that may be a way, but it is very hard when you're going near a Kickstarter to not just be like, I could just get it all. And they do look good. They do look good on the shelf. They come with a large box that holds all of the boxes and the matte box above is... Um, is VHS, so they, they're a bit of an event on the shelf. I meant to take a picture to show you guys, but um, it looks quite nice um, upstairs. So that's that's another tempting thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, that's that's Final Girl, which for me, if money is no object um, uh, and you like it, I think I can just recommend it. It's really good. It's a lot of fun, and it's really interesting how the scenarios switch it up um, and mimic various different movie experiences um yeah it's just availability right now okay well that final girl means this is all we have time for in the episode you can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standy uh, or on whichever uh, podcast app you prefer uh, until next time, we have been the last standee, so it's goodbye from Audrey. Bye bye! Kara? Bye! And myself. And remember, the second E in standee is for Elderberry, which is one of the dragons in English. <laughs> <laughs>